That's right, amen. Everybody is somebody in the church of God in Christ. Amen. We want you to be validated and celebrated here in this wonderful session. We congratulate all of the bishop designates and we concur that God has his hands upon your life and are grateful to share with you in this act of ecclesiastical ascendancy. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 through 5. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Let us pause for a moment of prayer. Eternal God, we thank you that you have brought us to this time and to this place, that you may plant deep within our spirit the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, for you are the greatest marksman there is. You always hit your target. Your word never goes out and returns unto you void. Every word that you send out has a purpose. We pray that this night your word shall fulfill its God-given purpose. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. For the sake of emphasis, verses 2 and 3 of Isaiah chapter 53, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. We want to talk with you for a few moments from this subject, the resume of Jesus Christ. Will you say that with me? The resume of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in breathing upon Isaiah to present to us such a vivid introduction to the prophetic ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It seems so very unusual that we would have such a precise view of Christ seven centuries before his birth. For the manner in which the Holy Spirit moves upon Isaiah gives him the ability to present a panoramic view of Jesus Christ, a 360 interpretation. Isaiah looks at him in the future. He looks at him in the present. And then he looks at him from the past. He's able to shift gears and use verb tenses that describe the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry from every angle. How is it that Isaiah can talk about someone 
who has not been born and will not be born for another seven centuries as though he has already been here. Well, his subject, Jesus Christ, is one who always was, always is, and always will be. And because the Holy Spirit gives Isaiah the spiritual transmission to take the power that is under the hood and translate it to the four wheels of this vehicle, he's able to project the Lord Jesus Christ as though the book of Isaiah is the first gospel. Well, let us accept this assertion that Isaiah's book is the first gospel because if there is anybody who has a gospel word concerning Jesus Christ, it is the prophet Isaiah. For Isaiah is the very first person to even use the word gospel. For Isaiah says, Oh, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. The transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ has such depth and significance that Isaiah proclaims that it even makes the most unattractive part of your body beautiful. Usually we put hundreds if not thousands of dollars in beautifying our head and hair. But Isaiah says the gospel message is so profound that if you proclaim it under the unctionizing power of the Holy Spirit, it will even beautify your corns, your hunker bones. It'll even beautify your hammer toes. Even your feet look good if you preach the gospel of peace. I want to encourage you, Bishop designates tonight, you have beautiful feet because you preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice how Isaiah presents this gospel message. For even though he talks about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is seven centuries into the future, he presents him within a contemporary context. The historical and theological coordinates of the book of Isaiah provide the prophetic parameters for the maximum fulfillment of our Judeo-Christian heritage. Jesus often preaches from the book of Isaiah. Jesus quotes from Isaiah 42 when he says that Isaiah speaks prophetically about this servant of Jesus Christ who shall not fail nor be discouraged. Jesus wears in Isaiah 42 and 53 the wardrobe of servant leadership. This is a radical departure from any other leader who has ever lived. Who else but Jesus would have the authority and the audacity to project the model of leadership as that which comes from a servant's heart? Jesus was prophet priest and king. Nevertheless, he chose to use the model of being a servant. Most leaders want to lead from the pedestal, but Jesus led from the very bottom of the social scale. Jesus did not aspire to ascend to the top because he had already come from the top. He chose to go down to the bottom because real ministry begins at the bottom. If you don't know how to reach people at the bottom, if you don't know how to love people, embrace people, redeem people at the bottom, then your ministry and message really has no essence. Some people preach a bourgeois gospel. Some people preach a middle class and upper class gospel. But Jesus preached a gospel to the last, the least, and the lost of society. Nobody was too bad, too sinful, too broke, too sick, too hated, or too despised for Jesus to reach out to them and lift them up. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we have no question about the fact that this book is the first gospel because in it we find the Holy Spirit giving Isaiah the ability to stand toe to toe with any New Testament writer. In fact, no New Testament writer can present a resume of Jesus Christ. And the reason why is because every New Testament gospel was written posthumously, which is to say after the death of Jesus Christ. 
You don't need a resume after you're dead. Now, you don't have to say amen to that. Just say, hmm. The resume should arrive before you arrive. It should present your qualification, your skill to fulfill the job. And Isaiah was so excited about getting the resume of Jesus posted online in the Holy Spirit that he writes it and prints it and sends it with a vivid picture seven centuries before his birth. Obviously, he has the edge on the first New Testament gospel writer, Brother Mark, because John Mark, that type A personality, that pedal to the metal preacher who uses the word straightway in his writing over and over again could not outdistance Isaiah because Isaiah begins with the same information that Mark begins with. Mark tells us about the MC for Jesus Christ who was John the Baptist but Isaiah has already said in the 40th chapter the voice of one crying in the wilderness make his path straight prepare in the desert a highway for our God he'll level the playing field because every mountain and hill shall be made low the valleys shall be exalted the crooked shall be made straight the rough places shall be made smooth and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the people shall see it together. Isaiah can hold his own with Matthew because Matthew begins by presenting to us a genealogy of Jesus Christ. Of course, it is an ethnocentric genealogy because it only includes 42 Jewish generations. Not just 42 generations, but 42 Jewish generations. He doesn't bother with those progenitors in the lineage of Jesus Christ who were non-Jewish. Because Matthew is so focused upon ethnocentrism, he can't really take his eyes off the fact that God did choose and use the Jewish people. Yes, the Jews are God's chosen people, but we are also God's chosen people look like it's a little quiet on that but how do you know you're chosen the bible says god has chosen the small to confound the great the foolish to confound the wise the weak to confound those things that are mighty things that are despised things that are hated even things that are not because no flesh should glory in his presence i know we fit the parameters of that qualification because we have been weak and small and despised and hated and nothing but god chose us even from the very bottom of the social scale he chose us from the galley of slave ships bound for the coast of America. He chose us even from dope dens and alleys and streets. He chose us out of darkness, out of sin and brought us into the marvelous light. Thank God for the Jews, but thank God for us because we are also God's chosen people. I wish you'd shake hand with somebody and tell them I know I'm chosen. Yes, Matthew gives us 42 Jewish generations. But Isaiah can stand toe to toe with Matthew because he says, Under us a child is born, under us a son is given, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Thank God Isaiah had the nerves, the intestinal fortitude to stand up and say the increase of his government and peace has no end. Don't you know that means expanding big government? Isaiah says of the government of Jesus Christ, his government just keeps getting bigger and bigger. While we have radical right reactionaries who dare to say that the government is getting too big because it wants to lift people and give them hope to give college education make it possible for people to get out of poverty that's too big a government but I'm glad God keeps making his government bigger and bigger his government is so big that he can put angels by my bedside while I sleep his government is so big he can give me new mercies every morning new compassion new loving kindnesses his government is so big he can open the windows of heaven and pour me out blessings I don't even have room to receive thank God I got a God with big 
government. He doesn't even have to raise the taxes. He's got all of the money, houses and lands, silver and gold belongs to him. He's got the whole universe in his hands. And he's got so much that if I want to grant, all I got to do is ask and it shall be given. Seek and find not and it shall be open. Why don't you look at him, somebody and tell him, thank God for big government. I want you to understand that Isaiah held his own even standing toe to toe with Luke because Luke can't even write his gospel unless he quotes from the gospel of Isaiah because Isaiah writes 700 years in advance the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he sent me to heal the brokenhearted to open the blinded eyes to set at liberty them that are captive to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord when Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth in Galilee he opened the scripture to this very place he read it and he can only read a verse and a half because Jesus is a doctor and a doctor has to know how not to over prescribe his medicine he didn't want to give them a pill that they couldn't swallow or he didn't want to give them medicine that would counteract with other prescription so Jesus said I got a pill for you but I got to cut it in half I can only read a verse and a half and they couldn't even take that because they rushed him to the brow of the hill to throw him down headlong Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in fact Isaiah can stand toe to toe with the gospel of John John is the closest human follower of Jesus Christ John follows Jesus so closely that even when Christ is betrayed he leans upon his breast for Jesus said one of you shall betray me John asks Lord is it I John follows him so closely that he's even called the beloved disciple but being that close to Christ means that he might have to use that psychological mechanism called repression when he gets to involved with the brutality Jesus suffers upon the cross there are some things about the crucifixion that John doesn't bother to mention but Isaiah tells us about the brutal mutilation of the body of Christ because he says of him he hath no form nor comeliness that is to say as in Psalm 22 all of his bones were out of joint his organs were displaced his tongue cleaved to the roof of his mouth his bones were exposed there is a direct parallel between Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2 for Genesis 1 and 2 says and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep but the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters well that's the way Isaiah 53 and 2 is he hath no form nor comeliness why did Jesus lose his form why did he lose his shape why did he become so disfigured unattractive and ugly we don't like this picture we understand that this is the resume that Isaiah gives us but the problem we have with the resume is that he has an ugly picture with the resume and we don't like ugly picture in fact we don't even like realistic pictures we don't pay photographers to take pictures that look like we do we want the photographer to take the shine off my forehead, take the bags out from under my eyes, get rid of that second chin I got. I'm paying you, photographer. Don't give me a picture that actually looks like I do. That's our problem with this resume. He sends us the resume of Jesus Christ. He factors along with it an ugly picture of Jesus. Well, let me tell you why the picture's ugly. Because Jesus has on his servant clothing, his work clothes. He has on his dirty job clothes. If you're going to wrestle with sin, you got to get ugly. If you're going to take the sting from death, you got to get ugly. If you're going to take the victory back from the grave, you got to get ugly. Some jobs, you got to get ugly with it. In fact, I don't even believe you can worship God trying to be cute. I believe out of your belly shall flow 
Rivers of living water. Come on, somebody, help me give God some praise. Come on, put your hands together. We have a problem with the resume because there's an ugly picture attached with it. But anything that sin gets on, sin makes it ugly. Jesus, the Bible says, became sin for us. He never committed sin. He never engaged in the kind of activity where he was in sin by omission. He never had any guile in his mouth. He never disobeyed God, but he did something worse than that. He became sin. Even though you and I were born in sin and shapen in iniquity, we never even said, I am sin but the bible says that jesus became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of god in him for when he took our sins upon him he brings to life that analogy of Moses in the wilderness when the people had rebelled against God and God allowed serpents, fiery serpents to bite them and poison them and they were dying by the thousands. And then God said, I'm going to give you a remedy. Take that image of a serpent and put it on a pole and tell them, look up and live. Many of them were too mean too low down to even look up and receive deliverance. But I'm glad that every time you look up, the heaven declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. When you look up, it is as though God has a message in the heavens exactly for you. Whenever you look up, it is as though God gives you a reason to keep on pressing your way. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Touch somebody and tell them, look up. When you look up, things start going up. And before you know it, your hands are up. Your arms and hands are like antennas. The higher the antenna, the better the reception. If you haven't felt anything, if you haven't heard anything, maybe it's because your antennas are down. Why don't you just lift your antennas and tell him, thank you. You see, when Isaiah writes these words he wants us to understand that method by which Jesus becomes sin for us for when Moses lifted up the serpent that was a vertical pole but Jesus was on the intersection of the vertical and horizontal everything was being thrown into this intersection it is actually a multi-dimensional intersection because the Bible says we are troubled on every side yet not distressed Jesus was troubled from the God side because his daddy wouldn't even look at him my God my God why hast thou forsaken me he's troubled on the relational side because all of the disciples have forsaken him and fled he's troubled on the emotional side as even within him he's personally and physically drained by the trauma of the crucifixion even before he got to the cross he prayed until sweat ran down as great drops of blood he hyperventilated because Satan wanted to kill him before he could get to the cross God had to send him God and angels just to get him to Calvary Jesus was being attacked from every direction but thanks be to God he had enough grace to stand up under the pressure this is why Isaiah says of him he is despised and rejected of men if you can't handle rejection you can't handle leadership because everybody smiling in your face doesn't love you everybody patting you on the back is not with you you got to be able to handle rejection you got to be able to stand with tears in your eyes with pains in your soul knowing that if God be for us who can be against us come on help me give God some praise and hear somebody Oh, my brothers and sisters, this resume has a very strong Afrocentric connection. It is as though the Holy Spirit has us in mind when he inspires Isaiah with this text. Because Isaiah, even in this capacity as prophet and gospel preacher, is different from his contemporaries. We usually have a tendency to call prophets 
prophets of doom because most prophets have a judgment message only. Most prophets only come to tell you about the wrath of God. Very few prophets have a complete well-rounded ministry like Isaiah does. Isaiah not only tells you about God's wrath, but he also tells you about God's comfort. His book is a composite of the Bible in that Isaiah has 66 chapters and the Bible has 66 books. There are two divisions of Isaiah. The first half, 39 chapters that correspond with the 39 books of the Old Testament. And the second half of Isaiah, 27 chapters that reflect the 27 books of the New Testament. The first half of Isaiah has a law, judgment, and justice emphasis like the Old Testament. But the second half of Isaiah begins with Isaiah 40 and 1. Comfort ye. Comfort ye, my people. He's introducing the Holy Ghost right there. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. That means that Isaiah doesn't just have a ministry to rebuke you. He doesn't just have a ministry to straighten you out. He doesn't just have a ministry to put you in your place. Some folk are good at rebuking you. They just don't know how to console you. Some folk are good at knocking you down. They just don't know how to stand you back up on a solid foundation. Some folk are masters at ripping you open. But I don't want a surgeon cutting on me and you don't know how to gently saw me back together I wish I had some help in here I don't want a preacher preaching to me and all you know how to do is cut me open if you open me up saw me back together this is why Isaiah's gospel ministry is different he has a much more inclusive message than other prophets. Yes, he is a major prophet, but of course, this is a superficial distinction. He shares that with Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. But the only distinction between major and minor prophets, of course, is that the major prophets wrote more than the minor prophets. But don't allow anybody to get you into this business of saying some people are major to God and others are minor because God doesn't play major and minor games. Everybody is important to God and if you put God in a corner and make him choose between major and minor, he would prefer the minor rather than the major because Jesus said if anyone offends the least of these my little ones it's better that he had a millstone about his neck and would drown into the depth of the sea Jesus was so focused upon minors that he said suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of heaven when the disciples were jockeying for position Jesus sat them down and brought a child in the midst and said except you become as this little child you're not even going to get into the kingdom of heaven don't allow yourself to be sidetracked by what's major and minor that's superficial there were some prophets that didn't write anything but they were major to God Enoch never wrote a book but the fact of the matter is he was so major that he had a testimony that he pleased God he literally walked with God and while walking with God he walked past death walked past the grave walked past hell right into glory he must have been major Elijah never wrote a book, but he must have been major because he became God's second astronaut. God sent first class one-way non-stop transportation to take Elijah from earth into glory. And he left the mantle and double portion behind for Elijah because not only is success important, but succession, succession planning is important you may not be able to say man just say hmm yes 
Elijah didn't write a book, but he must have been major to God because God used him in such a profound manner to speak to the people of Israel. In fact, Isaiah is a prophet, but not just a prophet. You understand God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints till we all come in the unity of the faith. But there are very few real prophets today the bible said many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many but there are very few real prophets because a prophetic ministry is not one of just telling the future but it is forth telling the truth it is uncovering satan's tricks it's exposing satan's plans a prophet is one who brings judgment back into the house of god because the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of god and if it begin at us what will happen to the sinner and the ungodly in fact there are so few real prophets today that the church has almost become a non-profit organization but every now and then god raises up a real prophet and thanks be to God, Isaiah was a real prophet. Not only a prophet, but also a gospel preacher. For he uses the word gospel before Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And makes a strong Afrocentric connection. And we need to make that connection tonight. Because I believe that there are more around us than there are actually sitting in the seats. For the Bible says we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses that we ought to lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run this race with patience. There are more around us than there are sitting among us. And that is why every now and then, by faith, we need to look up into the spiritual grandstands and see those that God has placed around us. You understand, in Missouri was the Dred Scott decision which helped precipitate the American Civil War, the bloodiest war in which we have ever engaged. Somewhere in the grandstands is not only the Dred Scott decision, but the Plessy versus Ferguson decision by Roger B. Tony somewhere in the grandstands is Emmett Till, a teenager, a member of the Church of God in Christ who was lynched in money, Mississippi, somewhere in the grandstands is Medgar Evers, a member of the Church of God in Christ who was killed for registering African Americans to vote, a field represented before the NAACP somewhere in the grandstands is the spirit of those who died anonymously for the cause of freedom for all of us. Racism is now stronger than it has been in years. And racism is a deadly sin. But thanks be to God in Isaiah 53, I see the Lord giving us a prescription for racism. The Lord knew that we would be hated, despised. He knew that we would be broken. So he used Isaiah to write this chapter, especially designed for African Americans. For the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, a black brother was sitting in his chariot on his way back to Ethiopia. He had been to Jerusalem to worship, but for some reason he didn't fit in in Jerusalem. I've been to Jerusalem and I didn't fit in either. Jerusalem is a very parochial place. Jerusalem is a starchy place. Jerusalem enforces the law of the Sabbath. They think you are different and you got to stay in your place. And that is why Jesus said the temple has got to come down because it's too racist. It's too segregated. In the the temple that was a court 
of the women and a court of the Gentiles. It didn't matter if you were proselytized. It didn't matter how well you kept the law. But if you were non-Jewish, you better not cross that line of the court of the Gentiles or you could be stoned right in the temple. If you were a woman, you better not cross that line of the court of women or you could be killed right in the temple. Jesus was so tired of racism in the temple so tired of discrimination in the temple that he said not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be cast down Isaiah 53 gives us medicine for the deep internal wounds that racism has done to us they were opened just last week when radical right Christians refused to stand up and say Mormonism is not not Christian Joseph Smith is not Christian mm, I want you to know Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith nobody comes after Jesus not Joseph Smith not angels not Mitt Romney nobody finishes what Jesus has already done and that is why it amazes me that Christians on the right close their eyes to a cult religion and endorse Mitt Romney for president but thanks be to God that the black pulpit is not owned by any political party for the Bible says cry loud and spam not lift up your voice like a trumpet show my people their transgression the house of Jacob their sins I'm glad God give, didn't give the preacher a clarinet he didn't give the preacher a flute he didn't give the preacher an oboe but he said lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion show my people their transgressions the house of Jacob their sins say yes every now and then you gotta hoop sometime you gotta wake up the dead you gotta shake up the complacent you gotta get people out of their comfort zone every now and then you gotta let rivers of living water flow out of your belly say it mm. oh lord i'm so glad we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I thank God that he has bookended the church of God in Christ 105 years. Charles Mason, Charles Blake. I'm glad that he used Charles Mason with a gin house, Lexington, Mississippi. He preached against racism. In fact, God used him to bring black and white into the anointing of the Holy Ghost must be something about him because the church of God in Christ a predominantly black church had a white baby called the Assemblies of God you can do things in the spirit that you can't do in the flesh you can birth things in the spirit that you can't do in the flesh i'm glad the holy ghost will make you pregnant didn't the bible say blessed is the man or woman that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful but your delight is in the law of the Lord and when your delight is in the law of the Lord you meditate in him day and night that's subconscious but when God puts it in your subconscious 
he puts it below the threshold of memory he puts it below the threshold of understanding there are things in me I don't understand I don't know why I cry sometimes nobody bothering me hands go up nobody after me running getting my feet I ain't running from nobody but something within that holy the rain something within that banishes pain I can't explain it but thank God I know there is something within when God puts it in you he makes you pregnant with it for the Bible says in Psalm 1 he'll make you so pregnant that you'll bring forth your fruit in your season you can't bring forth fruit unless you're pregnant you gotta have a seed in you and the word of God is the immortal seed in you and when the Holy Ghost makes you pregnant your baby will be bigger than you that's why Bishop Charles Mason had a pregnancy that was so big he said there'll never be a building that can hold all of the saints of the church of God in Christ look at what God did with Charles Mason in 1907 even before that in 1897 when he was with the church of God and before that when he pastored a Baptist congregation but he got pregnant in the Holy Ghost went to Azusa Street in Los Angeles California and while he was there he began to birth something in his spirit he birthed praise in his spirit birth deliverance in his spirit anybody pregnant in here tonight if you sleep with Jesus he'll make you pregnant Jesus wants you to sleep with him come unto me all ye that labor and the heavy laden I will give you rest take my yoke upon you learn of me my yoke is easy my burden is light say yes say yes Jesus will make you pregnant I'm glad I'm pregnant with praise pregnant with glory pregnant with possibility every now and then I just have to open up and give birth it might hurt sometime but give birth birth to testimony birth to miracles birth to ministry shake hand with somebody tell them if the Holy Ghost makes you pregnant you gotta give birth say yes say yes yes thank you Jesus if God could start it in Charles Mason God can finish it in the seventh Charles Blake if he can start it with number one he can fulfill it in number seven the name Charles means man we've come from Charles to Charles we've come from man to man what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him you made him a little lower than the angels crown him with glory and honor thank you Lord for crowning Charles Blake with wisdom glory honor understanding somebody clap your hands and give God praise in this house say yes say yes the resume says Jesus was wounded for our transgression that means he went to the cross that's what Isaiah 53 is about Jesus went to the cross suffered bled died was buried three days and nights 
Burr it on a Friday night. Burr it stayed in the grave all night. Friday, all day, Saturday, all night, Saturday night. But thank God, Jesus is a morning person. Jesus got up early in the morning, weeping, man to for night. Joy cometh in the morning. Shake hand with somebody and say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Joy cometh in the morning. Good morning, blessing. Good morning, prosperity. Good morning, deliverance. It's morning in your life. It's morning in your ministry. Say yes. Say yes. Come on and clap your hands and praise God in here. Come on and praise. Come on and praise. Come on and praise. But if you're upset with the ugly picture in Isaiah 53 let me give you a current picture the last picture taken of Jesus was photographed by John who said I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a voice sounded like the rushing of many waters a voice sound like thunder I thought I'd look around and see who it was and it was a man head and hairs like lamb wool eyes great balls of fire feet like fine grass countenance brighter than the sun who is this I am Alpha I am Omega I am the first I am the last I am the beginning I am the end thank you Jesus thank you for your resume thank you for your power thank you for your strength thank you for your spirit thank you for being wounded for my transgression for being bruised for my iniquities thank you for taking my whooping thank you for taking my punishment thank you for being striped for my healing with his stripes I'm healed lift your hands and say thank God I'm healed Thank God I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. Come on and clap your hands and praise Him. Thank you for the resume. Thank God I'm healed. Come on and hug three people. Come on and hug three people and tell them, Thank God I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. With His stripes, I'm healed. Say yes. Say yes, say yes. Come on and clap your hands and praise it. Come on and praise it. Come on and praise it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God I'm healed. Come on, somebody, help me say, Thank God I'm healed. Thank God I'm healed. May have tears in my eyes, but thank God I'm healed. May have scars in my life, but thank God I'm healed. Hallelujah. Help me shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for watching the Jonathan Desparney Gospel Channel. Make sure to subscribe to the channel.